All right, today I have my good friend and Renaissance man, entrepreneur, uh, musician, apparently going to be a future knitter, Scott Dix. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. Do you do you like being called a Renaissance man? You know, the first time uh, I was called a Renaissance man, Trevor, I almost took offense. I didn't, I mean, it feels good on one hand to be considered capable at many things, but on the other hand, uh, there's some uh, negativity sometimes associated with the term. It's the whole, uh, you know, Jack of all trades syndrome. Um, but uh, I prefer to be very competent across multiple verticals uh, as opposed to an expert in a singular one. So I guess I, I've, it's settled, it settled in after some time. So I guess I'm all right with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, okay, do you mean that I don't know anything or I'm just like kind of bad at a bunch of stuff or? <laughs> right, um, right, right. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, some, totally, I totally bear with. Uh, uh, I read something the other day that was like, uh, somebody was talking about all the, I can't remember some like famous writer or musician or something. And they were telling someone somewhere how they about all these hobbies that they do. And someone was like, Oh, that's so cool. Like, that's gotta be great. And then the, they were like, yeah, I'm not good at any of them though. And then the person <laughs> said something like, is that the point of doing them? Like to be like the best at every single one of these things, or is it just the point to like do it and try and have a different perspective and have a different experience than somebody who maybe doesn't try as many things? Yeah, I think you put your finger on something really important, and that is that um, you know I know I'll, I'll speak for myself and and none others, but as I was coming up through my teens and twenties, I looked at a lot of different professions, uh, maybe with a little bit of like, oh, I could do that. You know, what, what's so hard about? Well, for example, what's so hard about being a conductor? You, you get up there and you wave a stick, you keep time, you point to the people, you do the thing, whatever. And then you know, time goes by, you have more experience in those things. I actually have been a conductor of of choirs in the past. And start realizing there's a lot more to it than just waving a stick. And I am grossly not qualified to conduct really anything above a kid's choir. Like that is not that is not something that I'm good at. And uh, But there's that sort of early belief that you could. And I think that's, it. that's healthy for young people, right? To have that belief, if you have that belief that you can do something. Um, but it's also really healthy when you get in your 30s and 40s to actually have experiential context to back you up a little bit to be able to say, actually, no, that's really complicated. That's a very difficult thing to do well. And, uh, you know, as I dive into more and more, you know, I've got a lot of hobbies, a lot of interests, uh, both professional and personal, and uh, to really feel what it's like. I mean, I know that you're a cyclist too. You know, to feel what it's like to ride 100 miles in a day. What does that feel like? It's not impossible. Um, it's a very achievable goal for, for almost anybody of reasonable health, right? But to actually park your butt in the saddle for five hours, uh, it's a little different. It feels different. And it's one of those things that's about, you know, through the journeys of our lives, transmutating cockiness to confidence on the other side, or this belief that everything is is easy. Uh, and then kind of coming out on the other side of that and understanding that now there's nothing really easy if you want to do it at a good level, you know, great and expert or, or beyond that, right? Those that gets to be rarefied air up in that neck of the woods. So yeah, whether it's, you know, cycling or learning to knit, that was a, a, a hobby that my grandma tried to teach me. It defeated me time and time again. She's like, she's like, honey, you just got to relax. You just got to relax, baby. And I'm just like, I am relaxed. I am relaxed. It's the knitting needles. It's something else. And you know, so uh, during COVID, I was like, you know what, I'm going to learn how to do this. We're going to get this done. And uh, I just finished my first uh, multicolor. It's called Fair Isle Knitting Sweater. Uh, last week, which is pretty cool. I've done some sweaters before, but never multicolor with color work. And so it's a, it's a real challenge. And I feel like I've been able to sort of live some of my grandmother's life through this. And I find that it brings me a, a deeper connection to my family, which is a, a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Are you wearing one of your sweaters right now? I am not. This is a JCPenney $10 sweater. So. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. That would, it, would have been such, it would have been a lot cooler if you were. Um, so, so you've done... so. We're basically here today to talk about, I was going to say our Lord and Savior Jesus, but um, that's, that's a different show. We can talk about um, him too. <laughs> um, so we're here today to talk about like fresh starts, starting over, starting a new yeah. habit, routine, trying something new, Maybe, whether it's jumpstarting your career, jumpstarting a hobby physical fitness. I know a lot of people, myself included, maybe you felt this way during like the pandemic, maybe felt like they got out of their, their comfort zone of whatever, whatever it was, work, hobbies, maybe they got laid off. Maybe they weren't able to do something they liked. Um, maybe it was just like a fresh start. And some people are kind of kicking off things still now or like kind of getting back into the saddle. And I really thought you'd be a good person to talk to about this because you are such a multi-talented 
a multi-interest person. So I guess my, to start off, like you've done jujitsu for at least 10, 15 years, something like that. Going on 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. So you've done all these different things, jujitsu, you're now knitting. I feel like you've done some other martial arts and yeah. entrepreneur, uh, worked like government jobs. Uh, you've traveled extensively and lived out of a, did you live out of an RV or a camper van or something? I did. I did for about a year. Yeah. Okay. So you've done all these things. And I feel like if you told the average person that they'd just be like, how have you, how have you lived your life in this way with so many different things? I can barely manage the one job I have and my house and, and all these responsibilities. How do I start something? How do I even begin starting something new or doing something different? So what do you tell somebody when they're in that position where it's like, you know, I'm, I've got my rent, student loans, whatever it is, but I have these other things I want to do or try. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll say on one half, I've been very fortunate in my career, just the way that uh, my career trajectory has gone. I've had a lot of flexibility. You know, I mean, running your own company is like a, you know, it's an 800 pound weight that you carry all the time, um, but you can carry it with you wherever you want, right? It's always with you, no matter what. And so having uh, sort of being on the front end, I started working remotely in 2006 uh, when my first co- or actually my fourth company was born. The other three burned up in flames, but that one went well and I sold it in 2015. You know, we had a, it was uh, post Google workspaces, which used to be called the Google suite or something like that. Um, and, you know, it was a, a marketing branding agency with a heavy emphasis on uh, web development, things of that nature as well, sort of a hub and spoke model with websites at the center and it was fully remote in starting in 2006. So, you know, as, as things sort of unfolded, you know, coming all the way up to COVID, it was really old hat. It was just a way of, it was my way of life by that point. Um, which offers some flexibility, you know, certainly to be able to do these kinds of things. Certainly kids and, and families, you know, can make can present challenges on those fronts. But I think that the major thing that I've, I've learned certainly up in the last few years of my life is that expectations can kill just about anything. They can ruin anything. And so we've got to be careful, I think, whenever taking on something, it doesn't matter what it is. You want to learn another language. You want to learn to play the guitar. um, You want to learn how to knit. Temper your expectations insofar that you're just going to go in with an idea of curiosity, right? It's that beautiful Ted Lasso clip, right, where he says, uh, be curious, not judgmental. And I love that quote. I think it's it's terrific. But I, I think that anything that we choose to do, if it stems from a place of curiosity, as opposed to this judgmental, lots of expectations, you know, I heard expectations described as like a spider web that put out all of these tendrils. And the more tendrils that you put out, uh, the higher the risk that one of them is going to get plucked and sort of rattle your your whole web, right? And put you on guard like a, like a spider would be whenever something like that happens. And so I've learned to not lower expectations. I think, I think that's a, a mistake or that could be a trap. It's to have less of them, more focused expectations about how this is going to go. And uh, as I've done that, as I've sort of reined in my expectations and built something that is a little bit more sustainable, right? Whenever I think all of my interests come with boundaries on the outside. And I think that's a a good thing. It creates a little bit of safety. It doesn't wreck your dream because you've got so many ideas about what this thing should be. And I truly believe that human beings are more effective, more creative, are our most human traits come out when we are in a situation that requires creativity. Boundaries or, or sort of bounding boxes on certain ideas or expectations bring out the best in our creative nature as, as human beings. And so as long as I can stay in that place with a hobby, I feel like it's a good thing. When that starts to fade, I'll, I'll take a, a step away and sort of take a look at it. Same with my, my you know personal relationships, business life, business pursuits where you're te- sort of testing uh, feasibility, viability, desirability, right? You've got to be able to sort of be a little more agnostic in your expectations and go in with curiosity and not, uh, not the right answer, right? Because that's that's tough. Yeah, can you give like a, a like a concrete example of what that means to go go in with curiosity versus I know what an expectation looks like where it's like I yeah. I imagine like I'm starting up a new I'll just use a web design business. I want to sell I'm going to make 100 phone calls and I'm going to sell 10 websites. I'm going to make 30 grand and and that's your expectation. So what does it look like to yeah. go in more with curiosity and you can use that or or one of your hobbies, for example. Well, I think actually sales is a really great place to to put some of that energy, especially with something that's a, a new product or yeah, let's just start with a new product and and it's a test and measure game all the 
all the time. And so it is good to set up goals, right? And to have those sorts of things laid out. But I, I also think it's important to have built-in feedback loops, right? And those can be small, just in your own mind. Like, well, how is this really going? Checking in with yourself uh, to see how things feel, how things are setting. In the business world, you know, um, I know we have a mutual friend, Josh Carroll, who uh, introduced me recently to the business model canvas, a business planning model. And f learning to tell the difference between what is an assumption and what is a fact is a very challenging thing. And I think some people are maybe innately good at it. I, I was not, certainly not innately good at it. I feel like, no, I got this. I know what that is. And then I was like, looking back, I'm like, that was a <clears throat> huge ass assumption. You had no data to back up, Scott. There was no data on that. And so when you go into something, I think it's important to set a goal, give it a shot, see how it goes, and then go back and assess. And that reflection on those things is really important. Uh, otherwise, you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, the old adage is that that makes you insane if you're doing that. Now, if it's working, be as crazy as you want. That's wonderful. Um, but oftentimes things don't go exactly according to plan. I think that lived experience has to be a factor in any process that we, we take on. And uh, if we start finding out, I mean, something silly, I don't know. Um, cycling, your wrists are killing you. Well, you know, you either correct or you quit, right? It, it's okay. It's perfectly okay to walk away from something like that. Uh, in business, you know, you either correct or you die on the vine. And I've certainly died on the vine a few times in my entrepreneurial pursuits because I didn't know how to correct properly. And uh, certainly, yeah. you know, you do enough times, you start to figure out how to um, not, you know, hey, that let's not dump gasoline on that fire. That could be dangerous and, uh, and do it in a maybe a more thoughtful way. I'm uh, I'm very familiar with these feelings and like where you're like, yeah, <laughs> or like business ideas dying on the vine because maybe you were too stubborn to challenge your assumption. And it's kind of difficult though, when you're like, I'm going to start this thing and this is what I believe. And no matter what, because you, you, as when you're starting something new, you kind of almost have to have that a little bit where you have like an inherent vision or belief. So I remember when I was introduced to this concept as well, where it's like, well, what you're saying isn't actually fact because you think it's true. It's just an assumption in your head. And what are you going to do if it's wrong? And yeah, unfortunately a lot of times you don't get to that you don't you don't swallow that hard pill that you are wrong until you're at the point where it's probably time to shut the doors or to yeah. end whatever you're doing uh, yeah. you know trev experience. i think a lot of people <laughs> yeah exactly i think a lot of folks th this is an entwined intertwined with with another idea which is oh gosh it's one part humility i think that we've got to learn through the process um one part ownership, being able to take on certain things and understand what is what is a you thing and what is not what, what is outside of you thing. And I know that mm -hmm. um, you know that can be a struggle when you feel so passionately about something. To be able to admit that you were wrong is hard. Um, I think the biggest thing you know I'll use language learning as as a great example. But really, this could go on to dance, music, jujitsu. Mm -hmm. It can be starting in a new career that you're not as familiar with. You're not as, as you know, have little expertise in. It's the fear of looking dumb. It's the fear mm -hmm. of being perceived as silly. And most of the time, other people don't think that about you. I think I think that's fun. The yeah. the weird sort of conundrum in this situation is we look at other people and say, oh my gosh, how cool that they're trying this. Even if you think it's not going to work, right? But good for them for giving a shot. At least that's where I come from. You know, good for you for going out and, yeah. and giving this thing a shot. I talked to a few people, you know, that, that wanted my just opinion, which is worth what, you know? You take yeah. that and 25 cents, you can get a piece of gum. Good luck, you know? Yeah. But uh, it's been hard for people to hear that I think that there are some challenges or maybe there are other ways to go about it. And I, I think our reactions, and I've, I've been on that, uh, the receiving end too, where I've just been kind of obstinate and just like, now nah, I got this. And, uh, and I find out later that, you know, I didn't got it. Maybe that other person wasn't exactly right, but that self-reflection had to be part of it. Um, but, you know, coming back to the humility, this idea that you are going to look you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to, it's not about appearances. It's about the fact that you are going to make mistakes. We all do. And that there is so much learning that is found in making those mistakes. You got a whole, you just spent 40 hours knitting something and you got a giant hole in the middle. Great. We're going to learn to not either don't do that. or We're going to learn how to go back and repair it right at the end of the day. And it can be, it, it, I mean, that applies to every walk of life. And if we can develop some comfort with failure, make it our friend. And I, this is not new stuff, man. I'm, I'm quoting every, every person that's way smarter than me on this stuff. Uh, but now that I've lived it a little bit, I've read it a thousand times, but now that I've lived it on the other side, uh, I realized that taking ownership of 
failures of um, assumptions that you made that were absolutely incorrect, taking the fault when the fault is yours is essential. It's absolutely essential, both to, to personal and professional growth. I, I don't feel like you can budge if you can't take accountability for things. I mean, there's so many words that we could use to describe this feeling, but I think you get what I'm putting down. Yeah, for sure. It's, <clears throat> it's like, it's kind of, it's like a few things. It's like one is being willing to like not be like, I think I've said this in the past, but be willing to suck until you've like earned the right to be good at it or just have fun and suck. Like who cares? What's wrong with that? Most people are so worried about what other people think of them. They're not paying attention to what, what you're doing anyways, or if they are, whatever, (laughs) that's fine. That's it. They have their own, they have their own issues they need to deal with. Um, And then I think what you're saying with like the accountability piece is you, you have to, you kind of have to be a bit realistic. Like if you're, if you're knitting, right. And you're like, you make the mistake, you can just throw it away and be like, oh, the, the, the design I got off Etsy was bad. Right. Like like it's not my fault. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, but if you're real and you're like, okay, yeah. I did make a mistake or maybe the design was wrong. So you learn where to get the right designs from. Yeah. Like, there's always something you can pick up from it if you Absolutely. hold yourself responsible. So I agree. And Trevor, I, I can't tell you how, how happy it makes me that uh, this conversation is revolving around knitting. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Very unexpected. It's like, Scott's yeah, it is a little out. unexpected. I'll knit you a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Uh, but you know, those things are, there's just a lot of room for growth in all areas of our life. And, you know, if you start taking that over to our relationships, right, it's, it's no different. There are, there are tasks that we do, but then there are also ways that we are as people and applying ourselves to applying some of these same principles, curiosity, lack of judgment to our relationships, both personal and professional is a really important mm-hmm. thing as well, right? To, um, I think that I've come certainly in the last 10 years to value, while in my twenties, I valued capability, right? There's this okay. super long quote by an author named Robert Heinlein, who's, you know, out there uh, in in left field in some ways for sure. But it's a really long quote. that's like, everyone should learn how to, you know, con a ship, you know, make, cook, be a a great cook, um, learn to defend oneself, all of these things, right? There's just this whole laundry list. And is the, the summation at the end was specialization is for ants. And I, I was so inspired by that quote when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. And then um, and I took that to heart because it resonated well with me. And as I got older, I realized that there's a lot, lot missing from that list. Capability is one thing, right? Being able to do things and I can do stuff. That's great, right? Being handy is one thing, right? I consider myself kind of a handy guy, which is great. However, if we don't uh, also know how to have healthy relationships, maintain healthy boundaries, how to have conflict, how to rupture and repair in relationships, personal and professional, it's really an analogous thing to, you know, fucking up a knitting project, right? You have this like rupture and then you go through your mental process and you repair and then you go forward, right? We do that all the time, Mm -hmm. but it also needs to be done with people in our lives as well. We've got to learn that skill and it applies sort of broadly in the meta sense to everything that we do. And I'm working really hard in, you know, my young forties now to sort of apply the meta concepts of curiosity, ownership, sometimes extreme ownership, if you subscribe to some of those ideals as well, that this is on me, right? That these mistakes, these failures, they're on me. And, uh, and only I am in control or have the, the agency to make different choices, do things a little bit differently, learn from my mistakes and do better. I think that's pretty well said. But the question that I have is when you are using extreme ownership, because this is something I feel like I've been guilty of, we're using it. And then it becomes like, you're just beating yourself over, like beating yourself over ah. where it's like, damn, like I, you know, I, I wanted to hit, like, I, I'm trying to, I was, tr- we're doing hard 75. I made it, which is 75 days in a row of exercise. And then on week six, without missing a day for six weeks, I hurt my, I like tweaked my back and I couldn't do mm-hmm. anything. And I'm like, yes, that's my fault. I should have stretched, should have done these things before I worked out that I, and I wouldn't have hurt myself. But then it becomes like, you know, maybe this resonates with you or some, or someone listening that you're like, man, why am I, why, why do I suck so much that I did? Like, why did I get hurt? <laughs> like, like you just, you can, it's very easy to like go from ownership to blame. And so how do you prevent that from happening? Yeah. Well, you've clearly lived it the same as I have, right? Cause I've done the same thing. Just 
beat myself up. This is on me. This is on me. This is on me. And the answer is, I think it comes back to the, the, the core of what we were talking about before, right? It's, it comes from approaching your, your new situation, right? Which is all of life is dynamic. So when you, when you fall off the wagon, you get hurt, something doesn't go according to expectations, which we talked about earlier, um, approaching that with a, a curious mindset. I mean, you're going to, you might be emotionally wounded. I mean, that happens. It happens to all of us. And I think that learning how to, to deal with some of that, that stuff is important. But if we come from a place of curiosity, it's like, okay, this is where I am right now. You can judge yourself. You can beat yourself up. But I think, you know, most people that have gone through that, that process of sort of self-flagellation, um, you come out on the side and you realize it actually didn't help. It didn't help the problem to beat yourself up too much. You've got to take ownership. You've got to look at it. You've got to be able to accept, for example, if you did something that you shouldn't have done, you've got to be able to accept, you know, not only consequence, but that, that you were the one who, who did that right? You were not your best self. You did something wrong. You blew up at your boss, you know, whatever. doesn't matter what it is. You've got to be able to take that ownership, but also continue to be curious about that and, and focused on improving uh, so that we don't get stuck in that negative cycle, right? We've got to be able to break out of that. That is a tough thing to learn for sure. It's like, how do you break out of a negative cycle when you fall into it? And I think that curiosity is a, is a really important part of that. Staying motivated for a bigger picture, not a specific expectation, because that I think is a trap, but it is important to say, all right, I'm stuck in a negative cycle. I need to disrupt this and find a different way forward now because I can't walk up, right? Because my back hurts. So what am I going to do differently? What can I continue to do to stay on the path that I want to, I want to be on and understanding that path is not a straight line. It is a winding, circuitous. I think that was Simon Sinek, right? He talks about vision, strategy, and tactics, right? The vision is the firm fixed point that we're going to, right? So that's still there. If you still got your vision, that's wonderful. The strategy is this winding path that we don't know is exactly what it's exactly going to look like. And the tactics, of course, are the, the specific items that we do to, to move us along on that journey. So I think stepping back, remembering what your vision is, if you had one, is important. And then finding a, a new strategy or, or using new tactics to get there is is kind of the way. But judgment doesn't, maybe plays a small role in that. But if it's the prevailing wind, you're probably going to sail in circles. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that is the truth, man. Cause I'm thinking about those times when you're like being hard on yourself. It's almost like you're so focused on the wrong stuff that you don't have like a clear, I think that maybe is it is it's like, you're not focused on the long-term vision. You're focused on the short-term result. And yes. when you, I think when you lose sight of that long-term vision and you're focused on like, okay, so I'll use the, like the knitting, knitting example. That's a great one. So, right. So Let's like the long-term thing is long-term thing is I want a sweater, right? Short term is, oh man, I, I used the wrong thread or I put a little hole in, in this, in like the sleeve. Like you can just like throw it on the ground and be like, I hate knitting. <laughs> you know, like, like, why do I suck at knitting so much? Look what I did. But I, I can promise, I can promise you, I'm certain that some of the best knitters in the world have probably made more mistakes than, than like any amateur because they've probably put in a lot of time and a lot of effort and practice and through that mistakes happen. So I feel like I'm advising myself as I'm talking through this where it's like, okay, so like if the vision is the <laughs> no, sweater, so <laughs> don't get, don't get so caught up on, on the thread. Yeah. yeah and, and I, you won't beat yourself up if you know that like, that's the end goal. You set expect the expectation that that's where you're going. Things are going to happen. You're going to look stupid. Maybe when you're, maybe when you're done, the one sleeve will be longer than the other. So you have to like do a new sleeve. It's, I, I think it's just that expectation that everything is going to go perfect from every single step along the way that makes it really easy to judge yourself oh man you just you just kind of tapped in on something whenever um you know i we were talking about some web design web building woes that we've all experienced and things like that one of my <clears throat> you know i love the dream i love the dream big it's really fun to do that sort of stuff but i think i've developed a little bit of an allergy to frequent blue sky sessions where we just think about what could be possible this can be fun from time to time but if it's all blue sky all the time and what, what i mean by that if it's all ideation then where where does the rubber actually meet the road where do we actually start getting something done and so I started mm -hmm. developing an allergy to customers specifically that wanted to spend all of their time in that space because it, it felt good to do so. I mean, it's probably some dopamine, something in our brains that makes that feel good for people. And, you know, kind of alongside that, one of another word that really sort of um, went away for me is easy. Oh, it's easy. It's easy. Dude, I really try not to say that word. You know, there's always something. Mm. There's always something that crops up that makes it not easy. And yeah. uh, 
it's it's a fascinating thing and um but it's it is the not easiness that if you're curious about it can be fun i mean well you know i know you train some jujitsu as well it can be really frustrating to walk in after training for 10 15 years get the new guy that's been there for three months he's 20 years younger than me and just crushes the life out of me. I'm like, man, I think I got all these, all these moves, all the stuff that I've trained and, and that can be very, very humbling. Um, but I think one of the things that sort of comes out of that, and this I think applies to everything, right? Is when you get to those moments where you have no prescription, there is no binary answer. It's not one or yes or no. So I want a zero to move forward. You have to bring, again, your innate human creativity to bear on the situation and come out in a better way, on a better path, on, you know, in that situation. And I think that if we continue to, uh, you know, look at things through the lens of curiosity, when those things come up, it's like, man, that didn't go the way that I wanted it to. But next time I'll be able to deal with that situation better, right? Even though I don't have an exact answer for it, I've seen it. I think a lot of that, you know, coming back to experience and, and lived experience, factoring that in is really important. Now, when you don't have that and you can't know everything, you can't have lived experience on everything, no matter how many how many sweaters I knit, I'm never going to be the world's greatest knitter. No matter how many hobbies I take up, I'll never be the, the, the world's smartest man. That is guaranteed. But one thing that, that I've noticed about myself, and I think that, that many of my colleagues and some of my partners in, in the startup that I'm a part of will agree, is that having enough experience, having enough curiosity and enough people to sort of reach back to, right, building that network of, of trusted people, whether those are advisors, mentors, even protégés, I think that's a, a, something I'd like to come back to, the mentor-protégé model. I feel like in my particular situation, just because of my, my makeup, my history, my career path, um, I've gotten very good at triage. So looking at a situation that has a bunch of sort of broken pieces in it, and then working with a team to pull that back together to get back to level ground, right? And I actually find a great deal of uh, satisfaction in that. However, I think there's a big difference between, uh, well, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know, but presumably there's a big difference between an ER doctor, which is more of a generalist. They can get a lot of things done. That's maybe more me. I'm not trying to equate myself with the amazingness that is an ER doctor. That's a whole, whole different can of worms, but the analogy I think holds true that you know enough about enough things to be able to um, stop the bleed, right? And keep things healthy. And at this point in my career, one of the things I've really been coming up against, uh, Trevor, and I think there's a, a, a shift or a rebirth that needs to happen uh, for me is that I'm pushing up against the boundaries of my expertise, kind of getting to the end. And I know that, uh, so I'm a part of a group called Simplate. Uh, Simplate.io. Really cool platform. Super proud of where we're headed with that. But as we start heading into early rounds of funding and, and getting you know things set up, we've got a great group of core partners. I sort of got it to the point where I feel really confident. And now we're at a place where I, I really don't feel confident. You know, it's it, going through, I've never gone through the funding process. I've bootstrapped everything I've ever done. And there is certainly some fear there, but I try to keep that fear over on the curious side uh, so that I don't get shut down by it, right? Get stuck in a negative cycle where it's like, man, I, I've never, never walked this path before. I, I don't know that I haven't, do I have what it takes? There's a lot of self-doubt that comes with that. And uh, I'm, I can say in this particular case, it's really wonderful to have such a solid group of partners that, you know, we're all within, you know, it's like a marathon, right? If you can see the guy in front of you, you're not that bad. You're still doing all right. We can all see each other, but we've all got a little bit more in our, our verticals of expertise to give. And now it's uh, a place where I'm leaning on my partners, you know, and, and being curious and asking a lot of questions, being very upfront about what I don't know, what I'm afraid of. And uh, the more conversations we have about that, it seems like the more momentum we build, the more problems we solve, but we're not in triage mode anymore. That's the difference. And that is, um, that's where I feel like I'm, I'm starting to lose a little bit of control on that. Not, not control, but like we're, I'm out of my depth. And that can be a very scary thing, but it can also be very enjoyable and very fun. And so uh, I'm sort of trying to morph, right? I'm, I'm not the expert in this situation. I am very much the student and I've got to, you know, really embrace that student mentality uh, as we continue through the next year of uh, building the startup. Uh, otherwise, like we talked about earlier, you get stuck on something, you, you know, grab an idea, an assumption, and you're going to die on your sword for it. And instead, uh, as a group, we are taking very much a validate assumptions wherever possible, create feedback loops as much as possible. And uh, you know, whether that's in business or whether that's in, in, in your life, I think that feedback loops are absolutely important that we continue to calibrate who we are and, and uh, how we're doing. Yeah, for sure. So when you find yourself in a situation like that, where you're out of your depth, what do you, and you, you not out of your depth. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you're perfectly capable oh, of the yeah. situation you're in, but you're out of your ex. But it feels like I'm, I feel like I'm out of my depth. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to no. put it. So what do you do 
when you realize you're in that situation? Is that something, like in my mind, I feel like it's a place where you can, where a lot of, a lot of growth happens because now you're being pushed to like learn something new, try something different, think about things in a different way, learn a new skill set. What, what does it look like when you're, when you realize you're in that situation? Is it something where you're like, okay, this is not my expertise. This isn't where I'm used to swimming. It's time for me to go to like another business where I'm an expert there. Or is it like, okay, then maybe it's the same thing in jujitsu. Like when you level up to a different belt, right? So it's like you have a different, it's like a different, like what worked for you as a blue belt against other blue belts probably isn't going to work as a purple belt against other purple belts or black belts. So do you want to kind of share what, what do you do when you find yourself in that spot? The first thing I do probably is sulk, if I'm being honest, you know, or it's just like, <laughs> oh, I feel so defeated. You know, I don't have, I don't have this in my, in my toolkit. I don't know what to do. The thing that I've really been trying to do, and I'll say that over the past two or three years, this has been uh, something that I've been, been really working on. And this is, comes down to the like emotional IQ more than anything is say it out loud to somebody that is on your team. In my case, that would be our CEO Jordan, or our president Jordan um, Bergeron. Uh, it's simply to say, I got to tell you, man, I don't know much about what we're, we're treading into and I'm nervous. Right. And that, that was, that historically, this is just a me thing, but that's a very hard, that was a very hard thing for me to, to learn how to do, to admit uh, weakness, to, to truly admit that, or I guess show that vulnerability, huh? you know, that I'm, I'm nervous. I don't, I don't have the tools for that. And I found that, especially when you're working with other growth oriented people, both professionally and personally, they will hear that and say, though it will be received well, right. You'll get um, a resonance going back and forth where it, at least there's a mutual understanding. I think it, you, you know, you do your partners, both personal and professional, dirty if you're not honest about your weaknesses, right? Because so many of us are trained, right, to do that 30 second elevator pitch. And man, I got to tell you, I, I was just talking to uh, my girlfriend Nelly about this. And I said, I don't know what my pitch is anymore. Like I, I'm in the middle of something, like something else is changing. It used to just be this thing that I could rattle off. Bah, 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 bah. This is my history. This is where I came from. This is what I did. And it was just, it was so easy. Just roll it off the tongue. Uh, I couldn't even repeat it to you right now if I wanted to, uh, partially because it doesn't feel true for me anymore, right? I'm trying to move on in my career, get away from that. And so you know, identifying as, you know, a business owner that did X, Y, and Z, you know, moved on to this and this and this. It's kind of like, well, I'm, I'm heading into a very new chapter. So I've got to be more honest about that. And so through that process, I feel like that the thing that I have to do more than anything is admit vulnerability, admit those weaknesses, both to myself and to the people that are in the circle uh, so that we can all be aware that they exist. And I would, you know, of course, appreciate that in, in return so that we all know where we stand where our comfort levels are, where our discomfort lies, and then we can work as a, as a team. Because I, man, I'll tell you, there's one thing I've learned over the years, Trevor, I didn't believe this in my 20s. I am very much a pack animal. I love being a part of a team. It's incredible because I, I don't know if, you know, talk to people that like this, if I think you're like this too. If I could work for gratitude, if it would pay my bills, oh man, there's no better feeling. And supporting a team is a tremendous feeling. Conversely, not feeling supported by a team is a terrible feeling. You know, so I think that gives a lot of clarity, you know, about like, are you in the right place? Are you feeling supported? Are you supporting in those situations? But it all comes back to, I think, it, it just uh, honesty, you know, about where you are in a process and understanding you cannot be good at everything, but it's okay to admit that you're not. And, uh, and that is, uh, we have a core value at Simply, right? Be kind, not nice. Nice yeah. is, uh, you know, how's everything going? Oh, it's going great. It's going great, man. Thanks for asking. That's good. No, yeah, it's good. I'm really excited, really optimistic about the future, right? We gloss over some things when we're being nice. Uh, being kind is going back and saying, man, I'm not, I'm not hitting my numbers. You know, I'm not feeling good about what's happening. I don't like this process. I don't like what's happening here. That's the kind thing to do, right? The nice thing to do is to gloss over it and keep going. Um, but that doesn't help anybody move forward. And in fact, you know, it probably puts, you know, me on a path for failure. It can lead others to fail because they don't have all the, the, the all the, right information. And that's a, a value that I've, I've certainly developed is like, make sure that everybody has all the information that they need to be able to uh, make their decisions too. Don't gloss over it. I think that's very unfair to do uh, to people. There is a very big difference between like being kind and nice. Cause it's, it's like, if I send you a piece of work and I'm like, Hey Scott, I've been working on this. It means a lot to me. Will you take a look at it and let me know what you think? And you look at it and you say, best thing I've ever seen. It's great. Good job. And then that's it. That seems nice. But when you actually sit down and when no one's around and you read it or look at it, watch it, and you're like, well, this sucked. This part sucked. I didn't like this. I really didn't vibe with most of it, actually. And it 
was mediocre at best. But you don't tell me that. Are you being nice by by making me feel good when you actually think something else? And I think this was a few episodes ago, like 40. <laughs> um, with a friend of mine, and we were talking about this, where it's like, I always send him my stuff, and he always tells me everything. Like, he's he gen- his delivery is generally polite, but it's politely critical. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, what are you trying to accomplish with this? Who is it for? Okay, well, from my perspective, I feel like these things didn't make sense. And I think that they need to be much better if you want to accomplish what you just said you want to do. And that's like, oh, okay, I, that hurts <laughs> a bit to hear that my, my, my artwork is not that good or whatever it is. But it gives me the opportunity to make it better and to be better in the future. But I think it also comes down to empathy for the person and delivery. (laughs) So just being like, man, Scott, that that was a piece of shit. And then that's it. That's just like, it doesn't help anyone. Yeah, it's not constructive. Yeah, you're just like, well, now I feel bad. And also... I don't like you anymore. <laughs> like, I guess and, just, and I don't know what to change. I don't know what to do differently. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm just going to be a devil's advocate here. And what if, like, I, I don't know. This this could be better. It's like, bro, like, <laughs> no, don't be the devil. Like, work. I'm sending it to you because I, I want your opinion and to collaborate with you and to improve. I don't want you to just, like, like rip it apart and then just, like, leave it. Like, help me yeah. build it. Make it better. Man, you just put your finger on something really important, right? And that is, uh, you know, don't be the devil's advocate. Be Trevor's advocate, right? Hmm. Be Scott's advocate. And I'll, I'll try to do the same, right? We we advocate for each other in a constructive way. And uh, this is kind of a, a funny aside. I um, Back when I was running a company called Boom back in Pittsburgh, I was in like a I don't know what you call them. I don't go to sports games very often, but we went to a, like a basketball game in Pittsburgh and we were up in the box, right? The PNC bank box. They were funding uh, a nonprofit thing that, that I was adjacent to. And uh, I'm in there and this guy comes in and we just start chatting. You know, he's maybe in his mid sixties and had a great suit on and stuff. And we're just talking. I'm just like, <laughs> just me, Trevor. I'm just like, burp, burp, burp. hey, you know, just talking, <laughs> yeah, making yeah. friends and, and doing whatever. And, uh, and we got into this great conversation. He's like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, you know, I've got this, this company and we do this and this and this. And, you know, he's like, well, what are some of your core, your core products and tenants? And we, you know, talked about it and it was just a really nice thing. And he was just asking a lot of questions and, and, uh, you know, it, it's funny. I was in my late twenties at the time. I did not ask any questions. That's none. And he left. And somebody uh, from the nonprofit wing came over and talked like, man, you had a really great conversation. His name was Chuck. With Chuck, you guys really hit it off. I was like, yeah, he seems like a good guy. She was like, you have no idea who that was, do you? I was like, should I? It's like, yeah, that's the president of the bank. I was like, oh, hmm." you know, but here's the thing. During that conversation, a few things happened. One, he said something that I'll never forget. He's like, the world needs more people like you. I praise all he said was, you are a builder, not a destroyer. And there are so many people out there that are just looking to destroy, you know, whether it's egos, you know, break people down, tell them why they're wrong, tell other people why they're better than you or why they're better than the world. Um, we, we need more builders in the world. And that really landed in a way where I actually don't think that I was as much of a builder at that time in my life. Maybe he, you know, he said something that was very nice. I don't know if it was in, maybe it was kind too. He didn't know me that well, but I I have internalized that through my, my life now, you know, flash for 15, 17 years. And now I, I tell myself, I want to be a builder, someone who's non-destructive as I go through the world. You know, there's this, it's like we go through our lives on the, on the lake of life in our speedboat, right? And, you know, you've probably seen some of the, the crazy YouTube videos of, you know, somebody goes by, leaves these wakes, and it just wrecks everything behind them. And I have certainly been guilty of that in the past, just speeding along, unconscious of the wake of destruction that I'm leaving behind me. And now I am much more cognizant of, of how I tread through that water and try to leave it better, right, than wow. I found it as I continue to go forward. Uh, the second part of that was, and I think this is important too, some people would look at that interaction as like, because I wasn't curious, I wasn't talking, wasn't asking questions, um, as a missed opportunity. Oh man, I could have been friends with with Chuck, the you know the head of PNC Bank or whatever. I do not in any way, and I, I don't think I ever felt like it was a missed opportunity. It was a really wonderful micro interaction that happened in my life. He left me with a nugget, an impression of what he thought of me that I don't think I could actually live up to at the time. And now I have continued to try to live up to that as I've gone through my life and failed many times, many times, but it is nice. I feel like it was, I got everything out of that, that moment and that opportunity that I could have in that moment. And it was extremely valuable. 
to have that interaction with someone. And we have tons of those. I think that the new word du jour is, uh, and we talk about getting triggered all the time. People talk about glimmers on the other side, the good things. And that was certainly a glimmer uh, in my past. I've had many, many of them, uh, but that's a good one to hold on to. And I certainly yeah. continue to move forward and try to be a builder and a, and a bringer together. I'm sure there's a good word for that. It's not coming in right now, but uh, someone who unites people and, and brings people together instead of driving wedges. Yeah. I'm not familiar with this term glimmer. What's that? Yeah. So I, I think it, it basically has to do with uh, so often, you know, in our, our lexicon these days, we talk about like, oh, I was so triggered when this happened, right? It's become just an everyday sort of word. And, mm-hmm. uh, and for good reason. I mean, it's is a very, um, it's a word that everybody understands these days. And we've all, all had trigger moments, you know, whatever those things are, they kind of shake us a little bit and and then we move on, right? But I think it's equally important to look at the other side, which, uh, you know, the interwebs are calling glimmers. I hope that takes root because they're basically the opposite of those things, the things that make us feel, I don't know, connected, you know, the maybe it's one of the four points of connection if you subscribe to that, you know, seen, heard, uh, valued, trusted, seen, heard, understood, trusted, something like that. And having those moments where you can look back and say, well, this was good. Right. This wasn't okay. this was the opposite of triggering. This was settling. This was growth. This was health. You know, all of those kinds of things. Cause I think we focus so much on a society about how broken we are. Society, uh, you know, whether that's on the, the larger scale, uh, our corporate cultures, our, you know, processes, ourselves. There's so much to focus on and what's wrong. And uh, I think that it's important to find balance. You know, I'm sure Yoda said something cool about it, but finding balance so that we're also <laughs> recognizing what's going right and where those moments of, of goodness lie. They don't have to be abject joy, you know, where you're just over the moon, you know, it's like, oh, I'm just crying with joy. It's not that at all. It's just a nice thing. You wake up in the morning, you get in your car. Um, like I did this morning, I was pleasantly surprised. It's 28 degrees in Iowa today, but it felt way warmer. And uh, the morning air was just beautiful. And I got in the car and I was like, beautiful day. This is pretty wonderful. And, you know, it's not like you spend, have to hang on to those moments or anything, but I think learning to recognize those as well as the triggers and the negative things we have in our life will create some balance. And if you apply that to your work life, your entrepreneurial ambitions, your hobbies, whatever those are, there are glimmers amidst the struggle as well. And uh, mm-hmm. I think it, it serves us well to recognize those. I don't think you could have said that any better. It's it, it's so easy to focus on something that upset you or something that bothers you or things that aren't going well. And sometimes, like I, I went on a walk before the call and it was, it's just, a, like you said, it's a beautiful day out, blue skies, sun's shining. And just like walking without my phone, just like looking around and being like, this is a nice day, you know? pretty lucky to be here and or you know it's it's easy to get caught up in what's not going well versus what what you have going for you and like enjoying the moment as well as uh something you said before trying to think of what you said oh how how it's sometimes it's easier just to say like no and like not want to do things when in reality progress is always made from how improvements are always made from how not no yeah so it's it's instead of thinking like no you know i can't do that because Last time I tried, I, I didn't, I only, I accidentally didn't make a sweater. I made like a onesie on accident <laughs> and that's like, okay, well, how can I, how can I get better next time? How can I yeah. do something a little different? You know, maybe it's finding, finding that expert knitter in your neighborhood to go sit down with and get some tips. Um, I've got one Friday nights at the Renan Pearl in Mount Vernon. There's a, there's a, um, what do they call it? Like a stitch and bitch. And I'm like, I'm in, count me in ladies. I am there. Are, um, you, the, are you the only dude there? Uh, so far, yes. That's but cool, there, though. there, are, there are there are dudes out there that knit as well, for sure. Yeah, um, I'm sure. I'm sure so there are. I'm, I was I'm, just wondering if anyone went to this event. <laughs> no, no, not this one. Not this one. But uh, okay. Yeah, you know the how is that is an important thing. You know, um, I think diving in on on some of that to to not just look at it and say that's impossible. Where it gets really tricky, I think, and this is where you know I get stuck, and I think a lot of people do is. Sometimes the how has so many work moving pieces. It has significant real life barriers, right? You know, um, maybe it's your career. Maybe you're not super stoked about where you are. You want to make a change. That's that's risky. You know, that's hard. It's hard to change jobs. It's hard to change companies uh, and do those kinds of things. And I think that we've got to be cognizant that. So I used to be the kind of guy. Let me let me backtrack. I would leap before I looked way too often, way too often. And that you want to talk about leaving ripples in the water behind you. It's like a cannonball, right? That you're splashing and just kind of messing everything up for everybody. If you do that too much uh, or do it in the wrong way. And so I think it's important to get as much information as you can build your how to the best of your ability, but we can never know anything a hundred percent. What we can do is consider 
the pieces, the, the, the people, the areas of our life that would be affected by those kinds of things, and then make a calculus and, and honestly talk to the people that it will affect, right? So that you're, you're clear and upfront. Uh, and that would generally be like spouses, you know, children, loved ones that are close to you. That's generally who that's going to affect or partners. If you're in a startup and you need to make a change or something like that, and this is all hypothetical stuff, of course, but if, if you're going to consider the how, sometimes it requires talking to the, the trusted people in our lives, you know, the people who are not the devil's advocate, but you know, my advocate, people who are actually pulling for me to make good decisions and who will say, well, man, how are you going to, you know, I don't know. You want to start a new business. How are you going to pay your bills? Right. That's a, like, ask those questions. And if the answer doesn't land, if it doesn't suffice to have them see like, man, I'm not seeing it. You know, that's, that's really valuable stuff or, um, you know, the, how sometimes whenever it's just like when it's learning to knit, right. That's all on you. That's it's insular, right. You just got to find the time. You can get the materials for 20 bucks and watch YouTube. You can figure it out. Right. If you know, you, you decide that you want to live in it for a year in an RV and you've got a lot of people that depend on you. Well, you got to, there's a lot more to the how of that thing. And I think that's one of the things that I've really been coming through in the last few years, especially is learning how to communicate complex, challenging ideas to people that I care about deeply, not to win them over. That the, I think your goal in those situations isn't to bring them to your side. It's not about selling them on it. It's about talking about what you value and what's important to you. If your values align on those things, then you can move forward together. If they, if your values don't align, then you may have to reconsider and do something a little bit different. Um, but learning to consider other people and their values and how they align with what, what I'm, I'm valuing is maybe one of the most important things we can learn. So maybe you just answered this, but I'm, I'm just going to ask for clarity how do you deliver that message to get their opinion and buy-in like the the people who are yeah. invested in your whatever it is whatever yeah. decision you're about to make yeah i think it's important to and i'm learning this one trev so like i'm not the expert on this particular thing for me the biggest the big hardest part is always opening my damn mouth because i'm afraid mm. I'm afraid of what people will say. Uh, I don't want to create conflict. I don't like conflict, but I think we have to get comfortable with people. And I'm working on it, man. I am not comfortable with it, but we've got to get comfortable with people calling us out, right? Telling us that we did wrong, telling us that we're, that they don't agree with what's happening and being willing to have those conversations. Um, you know, again, back to the sort of rupture and repair idea. And for those of us that are conflict avoidant, you know, learning to, to step up, have those conversations, have trust that if you, you know, don't jump into ad hominem attacks, you don't start tearing people down with what about isms and all this kind of stuff. You just come in, you know, you state your case to the best of your ability without trying to blame somebody else or force somebody else into a different way of thinking. You know, you got to learn to deliver that. If it's not received well and there is a rupture, you've also got to trust that if you and that person have a strong relationship, you can repair it through further conversations, clarity. What did you mean when you said that? You know, and um, I feel like if we could all do a better job of that in our personal lives and in our professional lives, hard and professional lives, it's tough to just step up and be like, hey, CEO, I got a bone to pick with you, right? That's tough. It's got to be handled a little bit differently. There's power dynamic. They can just cut you off and say, you don't get a paycheck from here anymore. Uh, so, you know, there are some challenges. It's a how. The how is important, mm. but it, the doing is is very valid. And, you know, if you keep slamming up against the same wall, for example, in a, in a workplace environment, you can't, you don't seem to make any change. Now you've got to start thinking about some other routes, right? And do I, mm -hmm. do I belong here? Do I need to be somewhere else? But yeah. I think that, you know, I, I, what did I hear the other day? It was somebody that said, well, Simon Sinek again, I think I've already quoted that guy once today, but I'm going to do it again because I like him. Um, he talked about some of the, the, the younger generations, how they will quit a job because they don't want to ask for a raise. They feel like they deserve a raise and they probably would have gotten the raise if they'd asked for it, but instead they'll just leave and sort of ghost the company. And that is, um, that's not, that's an option, right? You can do that. Uh, but uh, I, and God knows I am inclined to go that way. Sometimes I just want to be like, Oh, I just don't want to have this conversation. I don't want to, you know, bring up this difficult topic. I just want it to go away, but I don't know that that serves us in the long run. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't serve me because I have, I've taken that approach in certain, in certain areas, you know, and it, it doesn't serve you well in the long run. You know, I think that learning how to have those hard conversations to, to speak, to, you know, say what you need to say. Isn't that a song? <laughs> um, get, get Say what you need to say and get it out there. And then you've got to trust that, that uh, you know, you can get through it. Um, but it's better than holding it all in. Yeah. Yeah. I think you really hit the nail on the head when you said the hardest part is just like opening your mouth. Because 
it's it's uh, it's it's scary but no matter what it is if it's a personal relationship where either you want to do something or you have a problem with something or work or be anything it's just like there is a level of fear that comes with it but i imagine with time and practice it gets easier and better plus do you really want i hope you're right buddy yeah yeah me too (laughs) i i mean this is a question for both of us, but it's like, do we really want to wake up in a world where everything is, if we have an issue with something or you want something to change, you want to do something new, do you want to wake up three, three months, a year, five years from now and have things be exactly the way they are with that thing hanging, hanging yeah. over your head? Or do you want to take the chance of saying something, maybe nothing comes out of it, good or bad, and it's just done. You move on, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's good. It's a good advice to just... Just put it out there and yeah, trust that, uh, probably, well, hopefully, what's that? I'll tattoo it on my forehead so I can read it to myself every morning in the mirror. Jeez. Yeah, do that. <laughs> okay, so I have like, I have one or two more questions for you and then we can wrap this baby up. So for somebody, let's say somebody's at like a new, a different point in their career. They've been successful up to this point. They left a job, startup, whatever it is, and they're about to kick off something new and it's scary. Maybe they've tried a few things and they haven't worked out. What what advice would you give to that person? Man, that's a good one. I've been in that, that spot many times. I feel like for me, and I, maybe it's, it's different for everyone, the most helpful thing that has come from uh, when, I, when I encounter those situations is finding somebody that I trust who has either walked it before me or has enough, their methods... Uh, are constructive, right? They'll, they'll, they're willing to have those conversations with you. And I, I have been so fortunate in my my short life thus far to have some incredible mentors. And you know, sometimes you know them when you see them. Sometimes they creep up in the weirdest ways, right? Well, these people enter into our lives, but the the sort of mentor protege relationship is a really good one when you can form those he- a healthy version of it. Right. I don't know that I have have thought through the prescription of what a healthy version that looks like, other than the fact that you were both mutually invested in each other's success, not interested in any kind of weird power dynamics or like, you know, ownership and, uh, and that there's mutual trust, right. That you can, you can speak candidly back and forth in those, those ways. And, uh, as I get a little bit older and start transitioning a little bit more into that mentoring side, I realize that sometimes it's, it's almost counterintuitive, right? So I was always the protege, never the mentor, right? I just learning from all of these incredible men and women in my life. Um, now that I'm starting to tiptoe into the other side, I realize there may be more to be learned from mentoring than from being on the other side of that, because it opens up so many um, pathways that you can be, um, first of all, you can sort of see what you do know, and it exposes very quickly what you don't. And so I was having a conversation with uh, a young person that I, uh, a colleague, uh, 21, 22 years old, and she was basically struggling, you know, and saying she didn't, she wasn't aware, she didn't know if she deserved the space, right? She just feels like she's taken up space. And I really wanted her to understand that, like, she is by far an A player, that we want her on the team. She's phenomenal. Her voice is welcome, and we want to share the air and the space with her. We want to hear what she has to say because she's, she's brilliant. And I had to remind her that, you know, many of us, you know, didn't go to, to school for what she went to school for. And even if we did, you know, I used, I mean, I ran a marketing company for almost 10 years, right? She is getting the newest knowledge. I'm already, I'm out, I'm outmoded, man. I'm outdated. So like having these conversations is like, I'm learning like crazy from, from this person. And so I, I let her know that, you know, anytime she's like, Oh, just thank you so much for, for this and that. I'm like, you don't understand a mentor protege style relationship, which I really just kind of like call friends, <laughs> you know, um, is one where both people benefit. It's not like I'm doing some great service and I get nothing returned. It's not noble like that at all. I am learning mm-hmm. at the same time. And there is so much to, to be learned on the other side as well. It's also a responsibility that comes with that to give, you know, hopefully give good counsel, not box people in, not not make it a power play, all that stuff. But um, I'm starting to realize now that when it's time to make a change, both finding a mentor and just talking to peers or, or you know, other colleagues can be super helpful as you ideate through a process because insight can come from naivete. It can come from all kinds of places, from the people that aren't afraid to ask what others might think are a ridiculous question. And uh, if you can, you know, have a sort of a mix of those people out there in your life, and I am fortunate enough to have some of those folks in my world to be able to just say, hey, you know, what can I, what, what should I do? Or I'm nervous about this, or 
I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think about it? And man, some of the best nuggets can come out of that stuff. They can change your life. You know, a new phrase that I learned recently from someone I look up to, um, a guy named Frank Vitale. He's got a, a company called Forge Business Solutions. He uh, used a turn of phrase, which I've heard before, but coming from him, he said, you know, just, he's like, at a time and place of your choosing, not everything has to, he's, he basically was telling me, not everything has to be addressed the second that it comes into your head, Scott. And I'm like, well, that's news to me because I just want to blah, 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 talk about it, you know? Uh, he's like, instead, you know, do it at a time and place of your choosing. Take some time to reflect, come back, you know, set, set the stage. And then when it's a time and place of your choosing, act. And I think that is that's something I'm still internalizing and trying to figure out what to do with. But man, so valuable, such a valuable piece of advice. And if I didn't sort of look to him and trust him as, as a, a leader, you know, and, uh, and a mentor in my world, I don't know that I would have been ready to, to hear that in the right way. So I know that's a very long-winded answer, but I do think it comes down a lot to our network of people. Uh, and if we can kind of set up our own, uh, it's almost like an informal board of advisors, right? In, in some ways, I mean, there are friends, but they're also um, advi- truly advisors. And if you can get plugged in to, to some good folks that are looking out for you and don't have a necessarily a vested interest and not trying to sell you something, on the other side of it, there can be a lot of a lot of learning inside of that relationship. Yeah, for sure. So basically what you're saying is to find somebody that's a bit farther along that you respect, part of it at least, is and then be completely honest and candid with them, which I think might be a hard part is is if you're in that position being like, Hey, I'm having a hard time finding like finding my path. Like that's just touching the surface. It's like you gotta be very real if you want to get very helpful and real feedback. Yeah. It's it's like, yeah, I'm I'm worried because I have things in life that I want to accomplish and I need to get a position quickly. There's things in life I want to accomplish and I feel like I'm falling behind by by not working through that like corporate ladder or getting my next thing going and then what your fears are tied to that. And when you I think when you go into depth and you're vulnerable with a mentor, they can be like they can relate probably better to you and they can probably give you better advice. So yeah. Just to add with what you're saying is like, maybe you did say it, but you're just, <laughs> just hammering it home. Like I've, I've been in masterminds, had coaching, things like that. And when you are blunt, honest, straightforward, when you share what you're actually working on, but even like finances, whatever it is, the results that you get back are going to be a lot more accurate and helpful than if you're just like, yeah. yeah, I'm just like, you know, I don't know. Stuff's, stuff's not going the way I wanted to. What do you think I should do? <laughs> it's like, well. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty surface. And you know, the weird outcome yeah. of, of being very honest with somebody else, if, if you can do that, if you have that level of a trust, is that oftentimes they'll reciprocate and they will also yeah. share. And then you start seeing that like, man, this person that I respect so much also has faces challenges. They have their own fears. You know, they, they have their own uncertainties, right, that are out there. And they will talk about maybe their approaches to some of those things. And you can learn new ways of, of how to, to face those things. And I think there's a lot of value in that. You know, I'm, mm. I really respect people that have gone before me that um, are candid and honest about their mm-hmm. missteps, you know, their, their mistakes that they've made in life, you know, all that stuff. And uh, I think creating that ownership and, and being humble about it and saying, yeah, I, I fucked that up that good me. and proper. <laughs> That's, that was all me. And, uh, you know, and not just trying to pass the blame onto somebody else is really important. So, um, yeah, I think that, that our, our networks, our people are, are really important. If you don't have that, you know, I think that there are ways to to build those networks. You know, sometimes it's through things like, I, I, you know, I was a part of the Rotary organization. Look, I'm actually, I had no meeting on uh, tomorrow, uh, again, uh, for the first time in a number of years. But getting involved with different groups, like you said, you've been a part of masterminds and networking groups. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of discovery on that. You know, you got to put yourself out there and that can be challenging, can be exhausting. But, you know, if you do the work and understand that a network is important, not just for selling your product and, and hawking your wares, but for uh, sort of the support that comes along with having a network, um, having those trusted advisors in your life is is uh, definitely something that will serve you well. Um, I don't know that it's required, but I certainly am grateful that I have those folks in my world. I, I think that's well said. It's it's not like, the, what's the saying? Your net worth is your net worth is your network, something like that. But yeah. it's also, yeah, that's a good one. it's not just your net, it's not just your financial worth though. It's your like yeah. mental health and maybe your, and your physical health as well. So it's, it's like your support system through challenging times. So I think when people say it's your, your net worth is your network, 
just saying financial is kind of short-sighted a little bit, but oh, totally, man. I feel like, you said. brother, I, I feel like one of the things, and you know, we can wrap up on this if you want, but uh, I had been thinking a lot more about my what my funeral is going to look like in you know mm-hmm. fifty years than what my bank book is going to look like in fifty years. You know, if there's certainly been on the other half of forty, um, I'm far more concerned with the quality of my relationships and my quality of life. And don't get me wrong, you know, we're we're positioning uh, companies for acquisition. Right now, I would love to be able to do that. I've never, I've never hit a home run, or certainly not a grand slam in the business side of things. I've had a little dinker single, you know, over the shortstop and ran it out the first, and I'm like, yay, I got on base, and that was good. That was a good business, right? I was, I was happy with that. Yeah. But you know, in the in this grand scale of things, it's pretty minor, and uh, so. You know, I still have aspirations on that side, but I'm also very, very comfortable, you know, playing, playing the game, walking the walk, doing what I can with the tools that I have, with the partners that I'm lucky to, to be walking alongside of. If we fail it, we're going to fail it right, right? We're going to make sure that we're doing all the right things uh, to push this thing forward. And uh, you know, I, my confidence is actually pretty good on, on that front, but it's also not a defining point of my, the quality of my life. It is a feature. It is a bonus. It's a benefit. It's a privilege really, to be able to pursue these kinds of things. But it is not the food for, that is going to make my soul healthy versus unhealthy, right? That is a, that is a very different kind of food. And the net, my network, um, which includes fam, you know, close family and friends as well uh, and beyond, is uh, certainly something that I, I value maybe you know, more, well, not maybe, certainly more than money. And you know, I, I don't know if we've ever talked about this. I grew up of, of scant means, you know, spent quite a number of years in a, in a trailer park. It was actually pretty wonderful growing up in, in a park in the mountains of Appalachia. Um, we spent all of our time outside playing, riding bikes in the creek. It was, it was a great upbringing. It was really wonderful. But when you grow up without a lot of means, your network becomes your wealth straight up. Your car isn't working and your neighbor knows how to take care of it. No problem. Right. Because next week you're going to help them, you know, fix that deck. Um, or you're going to, you know, take care of their yard while they're, they're out of town uh, for a funeral, you know, two states away. Like it, that network becomes something very, very special. And I think that uh, I'm very fortunate to, from a young age, have had that network, family and friends that were super dependable, always came through. And it taught me to be more like that, right? I had that modeled f- for myself and uh, I certainly aspire to that as well. So anyway, our network certainly is, is our, or our wealth, I'll say. You said network is what did you say it was our net worth is our network? Yeah, yeah. Network is your yeah, net yeah. worth. It's it's something I've heard many, many times. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I certainly feel wealthy uh in that regard of my life, you know, with the relationships that I have, uh, there's a huge amount of wealth there. And uh, if if I had to choose one or the other, I'm gonna choose my my family, friends, and broader network every time. Yeah, that makes total sense. So to wrap up, just one last question, then we'll then I'll, I'll free you from, <laughs> from this, <laughs> this uh, conversation. If you could summarize like three, three bullet points or three steps from our conversation that you feel like if you were in that situation where you're starting over, starting fresh, going after a new goal, what would those three points be? Oh man, those are good ones. I'm actually going through some of this right now. Actually, we didn't dive deep on specifics, but the first one is to, however it manifests within us or you, I'll say the, the broad you, the plural you, whether that is anxiety fear, anger, doubt, all of those negative feelings that are in there that can stick us in a negative cycle, right? Where we sort of get on the hamster wheel and we can't get off it. And, or we use those sort of um, powerful negative tools to spur action, right? If we spur action from a place of negativity, um, we might be leaving some ripples behind us, right? That cause some damage. And so the first one is, is to caution people uh, around making decisions when you're in, well, on, on the extreme, in crisis, right? If something, when your life is sort of an upheaval and you're like, fuck it, I quit. I'm going to go do this job. I'm going to do this. You know, it's like you just kind of like throw everything to the wind. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else is guilty of that in, in this conversation, but I've certainly done it. And it is not, you know, the outcomes aren't what you would necessarily predict. It, not to say it couldn't work out. Uh, hasn't worked out well for me to go from those places. So one is break the negative cycles uh, in those situations. Try to make your decisions from a place of, I don't know, what were we talking about before, like building or growth where you're not, you know, you're, you're being 
aware of, of the impact that you will make. So that, that's step one. Step two is definitely get it, making sure that you are emotionally prepared for what's going to happen. We, sometimes I think we think that making big changes and making a big jump is going to fix our problems. Um, but you know, there's this guy that I used to, <laughs> used to, I grew up in a very tight knit church community and the guy every week, his name is Dean White, great guy. He passed just recently. Um, he'd come in, give me a handshake, pull me in way too close. I was like, why is this guy shaking my hand? And he would always give me life advice. And he's one of the things he always said was, Remember, son, wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are. And I was like, what does that mean? I'm like 13. I'm like, what does he mean? Wherever you go, there you are. And man, it has become one of those things through my life that has become one of the most important phrases. It's just stitched into my my core, into, into who I am. I'm so grateful he said that because wherever we go, there we are. So, you know, as we go on this journey, I think it's important to make sure that we are mentally in a stable enough position to be able to drive forward. Now, you can do that through coaching. You can do it through therapy. You can do it through your own self-help. Just sort of being aware of where you are on the spectrum of things. I think that's a really important thing. And then, uh, you know, step three is when you take the action, when you actually get into it, feedback, 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 feedback. Mm-hmm. You know, and when, cause when you're not getting it, you can feel very alone. You can be uh, unsure of if you're doing the right thing, getting feedback from multiple people, not just one source, because you may hear something from one person. You're like, I don't feel like that's correct. You hear from somebody else. You're like, yeah, I don't feel like that's right. And then somebody else comes along and, and they say it in a way that makes more sense to you. So creating mm-hmm. feedback loops about your goals. Gosh, we do that in marketing. We do that in product design. We do it in so many different places. Why wouldn't we do it in our own mm-hmm. lives? You know, why wouldn't we do that there? And so I think that's probably a good thing. Don't make decisions in crisis to make sure that you're, you're okay as a whole person, um, as you move into things and make sure you get feedback from people, uh, as you, you go through that journey. I think all of those things, there's many, many other things I'm sure that factor into those sorts of, uh, these sorts of things, but, um, that's what I've been trying to do. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, everything you've, I feel like I've resonated with everything that you've said on this episode, and now I have a lot to think about. <laughs> like, how do I how do I shorten my feedback loops? Where am I? I don't think I'm necessarily starting anything new right now, but it's like, how do I use that those feedback loops or that advice in the in the world I'm in to make sure that I'm not missing any blind spots or yeah, or I'm I'm just continually thinking how versus like making decisions in crisis or just immediately defaulting to no. So yeah. I've really enjoyed chatting with you on this episode. I think it's been, I don't know, it's left me with a lot to think about. <laughs> That's for sure. But is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with before we wrap up today? You know, Trevor, I, I don't have a lot to say. I'm, I've really enjoyed this one a ton. Um, this is great. If uh, if there's anybody out there who's working on their career, um, they're trying to make steps in, in uh, a direction, they're unsure where to go. Uh, I love these kinds of conversations. I feel like I learned so much from them too. You know, I've got a lot to think about as well, things I'm trying to internalize. And uh, I would encourage if you want to uh, post a link to my LinkedIn or or my, uh, my, my Gmail address in the, uh, in the show notes, uh, please feel free to reach out. It's, it's really not a big deal. It's no skin off my back. Always happy to have a conversation with somebody that's growth oriented. Uh, I, I get to learn too. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Scott. And uh, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure, Trev. Have a good day. 